Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the final presentation for the afternoon. Hope everybody's having a good Saturday. And I want to uh, welcome you again and uh, we'll just get right into it. Start talking about uh, email etiquette. I am the maestro at pcmaestro.com. So there's some information there that will also be available at the end of the presentation. Uh, the objective today really is to understand the importance of using proper email etiquette, managing your messages and your email folders. Uh, having a little discussion on email security and protection, dealing with phishing, rumors, email hoaxes, uh, get you an education on the FTC's Can Spam Act. And there's other email etiquette resources available. You want to understand information about email technology and your terminology. And there are alternatives to using our friends at Outlook and or webmail to send and receive your email. Now, the first question we're going to ask is, what is email? And really, it's electronic mail or electronic messaging. And this is a substitute or replacement to the old style paper correspondence when we used to type letters or actually write letters, possibly an alternative to conversation or discussion. Now, the reason I mention that is because I'm going to get into that concept where we seem to have gone away, and that's why we need email etiquette. We've gone away from the formal style of paper correspondence when we used to actually hand write letters or type letters in the old style. So one of the questions we talk about is the subject line. And the subject line on your email should be short and concise. It should be a summary of the message itself. And it should be, must be relevant to the body of the message, the topic that you're talking about. And it would replace the old RE or the regarding concept of the old paper correspondence. And it gives your recipient an idea of what information is going to follow. It should never be left blank. So your formatting, your layout of your email, again, the subject line should be short, let's say 20, 30 characters, not a, not a tweet message of 140, 120 characters, something like that, uh, and certainly not blank. The email, the body of the email should be visually appealing. You want your readers to look at it and not be, what the heck is going on? I've got a run on sentence here. You don't want to do that. You also want to consider how the message it might be read whether it's using an email program or they're looking at it, uh, your reader is looking at it on webmail or an email client on their computer, on their full screen or a small screen, such as a tablet or a smartphone, uh, something like that, or possibly a text message. You want to avoid one long sentence. You want to divide it up into paragraphs. One of the things we talk about in email etiquette is to avoid all caps. Since that's considered yelling, and you don't want to yell to your readers, you want to make it look reasonable. So if you do have a problem with some of your readers that uh, have a visual impairment, you want a larger cap or a larger font, don't put it in all caps. You might be able to increase the font size to a larger font size to deal with that, but certainly don't put it in all caps. You want to use an extra line between your paragraphs and use bullet points where possible. Avoid your fancy fonts and type styles because they may not always show up on all computers and on all mobile devices. That pretty much works, but uh, you never know what somebody's going to use an older phone that can get text and email, but nothing else. And it's a good idea to spell check before sending your mail. Uh, I know we use a lot of abbreviations, LOL, and, and things like that. Those are fine. Uh, but it's a good idea on a normal correspondence to do that spell check. Most of your email programs do have a spell check option that can be turned on that says spell check before sending. When you close out your email, again, this goes back to normal correspondence of the old style. So, excuse me, sign off at the end of your message. Use an extra line or two between the last sentence and your closing signature and sign off with your real name. Include a business name if you're representing a business or an organization, such as APCUG, uh, and your title. And you might want to add additional contact info, such as your fax number, if you're still using fax, your mobile number, uh, an office number. We all have multiple phone numbers now. Many of us do. So you want to provide that information. If you're representing a business organization, put down the website address and any possible other information or links that might be important for the reader to be able to click and find you or find your information a lot more quickly. <clears throat> when we talk about sending mail, 
addressing and sending the message. We traditionally use the send to or the, and or the carbon copy for the email recipient. Uh, and, they, and when you use carbon copy, you need to understand that the person on the other end of that carbon copy should be a party to the uh, email itself, should be a party to the action of that email, a part of the discussion, whether it's business or personal. You understand that all email recipients will visually see all other recipients' name and email addresses. So everyone knows who's sending and receiving the email at all times. The reason I bring that up is my pet peeve and my problem issue is the lack of using blind carbon copy or BCC. Too many people ignore BCC and just send to everyone. Uh, you want to use blind carbon copy when sending a general announcement, an invitation, an ad, something like that, uh, or you don't, or even sharing a joke. You don't need to send to or carbon copy everybody on the list. The recipients will not see the name of everyone involved with that email. You're really just saying, hey, I got a joke to share, or I'm going to be late to today's conference because the traffic and whatever. It's a cleaner look. And the recipients will only see the person that's sending the information. Be aware that every email system has an option for blind carbon copy. You may have to look for it, but it's there. So look around even on your smartphone and, and look for that blind carbon copy. And that really is one of my passions because I'll be, I'll be driving along and I know I'm not supposed to drive and, and, and check my email, but I'll get an email with 150 people on it. And I'm having to scroll down four, five, six screens on my cell phone just to get to the body of the message and says, hey, we're running a little late. Can you come later? Can you be on time? Or we're not going to meet at, at, at that restaurant. We're going to meet at the other Starbucks. A short and sweet message, and you have to scroll down six or eight lines to deal with that. So that's why blind carbon copy is one of the more important features that a lot of us seem to not use. And, and I will email people and say, you should have sent that using blind carbon copy. Email attachments. Well, if you have more information to share, more, de more detailed information, you might want to attach a saved file. And, and saved files can be in many types, Word documents, Excel, PDF, whatever, pictures. Save it, uh, excuse me, attach those if appropriate. But be careful what type of file you're attaching. You need to understand that not everybody has the appropriate software capable of opening every file you sent. So it's a good idea on the bottom, I know in this normal correspondence, when we used to write letters, we would say at the bottom of the letter, attached, find, or I am attaching a Word doc, the contract, whatever, regarding this. So you wanna say at the bottom of your email, and most people don't do this, uh, a Word file, a JPEG, a picture, a PDF, excuse me, a, a PDF, an Excel file, or perhaps I'm attaching my QuickBooks company file or my Quicken file. That's okay as long as the other person has the appropriate version of Quicken or QuickBooks be able to open it. Your accountants and CPAs usually do, but not everybody does. So be aware of what you're sending and whether the other person can deal with it. Uh, it's not a matter of whether you're sending from a Windows computer, a Linux computer, or a Mac computer. It's email. Email is email, uh, but what you send may be quite different. So uh, be aware of that. If you don't have the correct software, you might not be able to open it. I had a client call a couple weeks ago, and they said, somebody sent me a file, and I can't open it. And I said, what kind of file was it? They said, we don't know. And I said, well, what does it look like? Because I don't know. I can't open it. I said, forward me the email. So they forwarded me the email on my iPhone, and immediately it opened up. Uh, it opened up on my iPhone in Numbers, which is an Apple product. So I knew it was Apple Numbers, which is their version of a spreadsheet. So we were able to deal with that. So if you still think you can't open it or I can open it, be, be aware and kind of question what you're sending and who you're sending it to. My client had a Windows computer, did not have Apple numbers, and they were able to deal with it. Yeah, everybody should be able to open a JPEG picture. And if they have the Adobe Reader as a minimum, they should be able to open Adobe an Adobe PDF file. 
but not everyone has Quicken or QuickBooks. Not everybody has that old program called MS Works. That was Apple, that was Apple. That was Microsoft's kind of low end free word processor spreadsheet kind of thing. Not very compatible with even Word in the old days and we would send it out and then nobody would be able to open that stuff. Uh, Apple Pages, Apple Numbers, I've mentioned, those are their versions of, of what comes with an Apple uh, a Mac product. Uh, and, and there are ways to convert or save uh, pages or numbers into an Excel file or a Word file, but not a lot of people remember to do that. The Mac people think to think that everybody has everything, because I do, you know, and it doesn't work that way. AutoCAD files, Photoshop, Microsoft Publisher, uh, things like that. Not everyone has those files available or those pieces of software available. Most people have Office, which would include Word, Excel, things like that, or an alternative to Office, such as OpenOffice or, uh, or uh, some of the other ones that are out there, LibreOffice, they should be able to open that. But not everybody does. You have CRM software, uh, customer relations management like ACT or things like that. Not everybody can open those. So there's a lot of things out there that we tend to, everybody should be able to open my program, my file, and it doesn't work that way. If you get a suspect, you get a, a file that is an unknown, you can actually go to fileinfo.com and do a search for the type of file that's out there and really get an education about the different types of files and what programs created it. So the other thing on attachments, is don't send your life story uh, via email. You need to consider who you're sending it to, not just for privacy issues, but the size of your attached files. Does the recipient on the other end have a fast enough internet service and a fast enough computer to be able to download a huge file? Maybe they're using Wi-Fi, Maybe their smartphone is in a bad area or their cell signal is a little flaky, depending on where they are, and they might not be able to download that entire file attachment. So consider those things. Not everybody has the fastest cable, broadband, fiber, internet service available. So you kind of wonder whether they really need that file. And is there another way to get the file over to them via a Dropbox, a Google Docs, uh, your cloud backup service, such as iDrive or something like that. If you're sharing a video, you might be able to do it with YouTube on your YouTube channel. Uh, photo sharing, there's a number of options out there. Flickr, Snapshot, Snapfish, sorry about that. Photo bucket, uh, all those types of things. So there's a lot of ways to share stuff without sending it via email. When we talk about addressing and sending, my, my, my question and my concept of email forwarding, be careful when you forward your received messages to others, especially when you're driving or they're driving and they have to scroll through it. Please clean up your forwards of others forwarded email. Now I'm gonna say this once or twice, see if I can repeat it. Don't just forward a forward of a previously forwarded message. You want to clean that stuff up. You can clean up the garbage and, and watch how you forward, especially when you're sending it from a smartphone where you don't have the capability at all times to edit out some of the other stuff. Again, you're dealing with messages with 120, 200, 20, 30 email addresses that are in there. Mary sent it to Jane and 20 other people. Jane sent it to to John and sent it to 25 other people. And you're seeing a history of these entire forwards of this one thing which may be a joke. And you don't need to see everybody sent it to everybody else uh, before you get to the joke itself or the content of the message, which usually is gonna be short and sweet. So use blind carbon copy and clean up other people who don't use blind carbon copy uh, clean up their forwards so that you send the body of the message simply and easily. I want the information. I don't want to see it was sent to 20 or 30 or people uh, that, that, that don't need to be involved. Again, you don't want to spread rumors and scams. That's the same type of problem with forwarding other people's messages. Don't send a message or forward a message about that worst virus ever, because there's no such thing. 
uh, avoid forwarding messages about scams and get rich quick scheme, get rich quick schemes. Bill Gates is not sending everyone money because they signed up for something. He's going to keep his money. He's doing fine. He's not going to share it with everyone that won't talk about the Gates Foundation. They do have other things to deal with that, but that's a different way to send money or to share money. Don't want to forward rumors and scams to everyone in your address book because someone or the email said you must send this to everyone in your address book because that's how we say we share rumors, scams, things like that. You can actually verify the rumors and the get rich quick schemes at Snopes.com, more the popular one, trutherfiction.com, or even factcheck.org. Uh, I would say jokes, funny videos can go viral. Rumors and scams should not. You want to be an email angel when you are sending your email and sharing those jokes and, and fun stuff. You can also share it on Facebook or other social media. When you reply to email, you want to reply to the sender and only the sender because if you're resending, if somebody sent you one and did not do it blind carbon copy and you're seeing 150 send twos out there, or 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 of them, and you accidentally hit reply all, you might actually be sharing personal information that you want to intend for the sender with hundreds of other people, most of which you've never met. So don't reply to an old message and now the other thing is don't reply to an old message and start a new topic of discussion. Start a whole new email. Now I'm going to change the tune in the middle of this discussion right now. And I'm going to go ahead and change our email etiquette and start talking about virus protection and backup systems. Well, wait a minute. You're going to say, I signed up to hear about the maestro's presentation on email etiquette. How the heck do you have the right to change the subject to talk about my favorite backup protection? I don't, but when you change the topic in your email and you don't change the subject line, which has happened many times, that's what you're doing. You're changing the conversation, but you're not telling the recipient at the other end, hey, we're going to talk about something new. So don't reply to an old message and start a new topic. I had somebody email me the other day about happy birthday. Thank you very much. My birthday's in April, not November. But they were emailing me, asking me a question about a family gathering or virus protection. And I'm thinking, but the subject line said, happy birthday. And I said, this is the only way that person could find me was to reply to my birthday greeting from six months ago. That's not the way to do it. Change that subject line and make it current for the topic that you are discussing. Which leads me into the next topic, and that is using your address book. All of your email programs and even your smartphone uh, and your iPad have an address book where you can keep email addresses in there. You want to update that email address book with the email addresses of people you deal with. Use your address book. Some email programs can actually configure your email system to save the email addresses automatically of most people you're dealing with. So you don't want to simply reply to an old message, forget to change the subject line, because you didn't have the other person's email address. You had it, you don't, you don't need to wish me a happy birthday when my birthday was six months ago. There's another way to find me. I'm available, and it isn't just me. When we talk about uh, email system management, you want to talk about backing up folders and conversations. And that's actually emailing your, uh, your, your managing your email system. Back up your email messages, especially when you're using a POP or POP3 based email. And I'm going to talk about that concept in a couple slides. You can capture the screenshot for your email settings. Uh, which I'll also talk about in a couple minutes. Do you also want to back up your email address book using the, uh, that program, that email program's export function, or there may be a built-in uh, backup concept out there. It's a good idea to back up your email uh, one way or another. You don't want to throw everything into the inbox. It's not your kitchen junk drawer that everyone has or the junk drawer out in the garage. You use what I like to call personal project folders. 
move all of the messages from both the inbox and your sent box for a, cons for a topic you're dealing with to a personal project folder. You can create many folders. You can do this on an email like Outlook. You can do it on a webmail like Gmail. And I create a folder for APCUG Speakers Bureau. I have a folder for my, <coughs> excuse me, a Los Angeles Computer Society. I have a folder for family issues. And all of my conversations back and forth between the other people at APCUG uh, that are online today, I would have a folder for them and all my conversations with them would be in that folder for APCUG or CUG, APCUG uh, Speakers Bureau Fall Conference. So this keeps a history of your back and forth discussion, what they call conversations in one place. And a lot of people ignore the sent box. They might move the messages in the inbox to that personal project folder but forget about doing it for the sent box. And you want to include that information and keep it, uh, keep it all in one place. You don't want to create what I'll call that personal project folder as a subfolder of the inbox because a virus could attack your inbox, take all those messages and all those folders with them. The inbox is really the first point of attack for a lot of incoming viruses. Hopefully you have virus protection that'll catch it but I've actually seen inboxes in the old days become totally corrupt because a virus hit it and wiped out the inbox, the sent box and the other folders were clean. So don't use your inbox as a place to put those subfolders. You can create them lower down. So. so your whole folder system needs to be managed. And that's another thing that we need to manage and maintain on our computer. Clean up your email messages and delete the old messages that are no longer needed. Now, I'm not gonna tell you to delete things you need for permanent record, which would be contracts, agreements, uh, certainly your software purchases that you've downloaded and paid for software because we don't get CDs anymore. Keep those things in a personal project folder called software or things like that or contracts, but I don't need to keep the information about my birthday party or, or what I'm doing last Christmas. Uh, in a folder, we're already done with that. My birthday is over, coming up on another year. I can delete all those messages that related to last year's birthday party uh, because it's no longer current and I don't need to that my back and forth conversations about people coming to the dinner or not coming to the dinner or what restaurant we're going to. You can delete all those. You don't need to keep them. I think we get a little overwhelmed and we don't take the time to delete those things and I think we should. Some of those things that you wanna keep for permanent record, you can actually take an individual message and print it as a PDF formatted file if you have an option, and there are many options available to use a print to PDF and you can save that or print that message as a as a PDF and save it in your My Documents folder or other folder that would be appropriate. So you have a more permanent record, um, <clears throat> a more permanent record of the, um, of the email message itself. Uh, and, and you can get to that a lot more easily than, than keeping it in your email. So those are ways to keep those permanent records of, of things that are out there. You wanna empty your deleted or your trash folder from your email system. I didn't say delete the folder, but empty the contents of it. If you put it in the trash, it's ready for the garbage man to pick it up when he comes in or they come in at the end of the week. You wanna do the same thing with your email. People tend to leave it in the trash and don't deal with it. So uh, that's something to clean up. You know, um, Do you wanna review your junk mail or your spam mail folders and clean them up? You might find messages out there as I have I didn't realize I got a message from, from somebody at APCUG regarding the conference, and it was in my junk file, uh, and I had to move it into my normal file. So you can mark it, mark it as legitimate and not junk. That only happened once. The rest of them all came through. So Outlook, Thunderbird, and some of the other email programs, you can actually compress or compact the email. That makes it run a little more efficiently. 
Uh, you can consider that concept, the compressor compact folder uh, concept, sort of like a defragmentation for your outlook, your, your email folder. Uh, and it does make it a lot more efficient and it will slow, it will speed up your email slightly and compress the size of your Outlook file or your Thunderbird files, so something like that. You wanna back up your address book separately from your mail system because it's just a good idea and there are times you wanna be able to take your address book and maybe move it into a constant contact or a MailChimp or share it or, or, or do a mailing list or something like that. Uh, there are reasons you might wanna do that. So it's a good idea to find out how to do that there are many reasons to uh, have an address book separate for other purposes that you're doing away from your email system. So we talk about email protection and attachments and links. You can send them, you can send a link in your email, but when you receive it on the other end, you wanna be careful about that. Be careful what attachments or links you open. If you're not expecting an email from someone, or you don't normally receive email from that person, there's a good chance the email is a scam or a virus or contains a virus. So be suspicious of, no, of even known senders like your family members. Uh, I've been receiving email from my wife from her office and it said, open this. And then there was a link in the body of the message, no signature, she didn't sign off. And, uh, and it was coming from her office and they got hacked. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a dirty link to a bad website. So you wanna be careful even from people that send mail to you normally. So be suspicious of those and there are ways to deal with that kind of stuff also. I think I'll talk about that in the next slide. Be suspicious of those financial entities or, or e-shoppers, the, you know, the websites, the, the online stores, the Amazons and all the other ones out there that might request account info or password information. You gotta ask yourself whether you even have an account with that company, with that credit card, with that retailer. I don't have an account with Wells Fargo. I don't have an account with Chase Bank, but I got an email from them the other day that said, there's something going on in your account. Please send us your email address and your password. Click here. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. Because I'm not doing that. I don't even know who you are. But it's gotten bad out there where you can actually copy a corporate logo and make it look reasonably official. There's some scams and rumors going on that make it really bad. So wonder, do you even have a relationship with that bank? Or, or financial institution or something like that. And I would suggest if you get an email from your bank or, or your credit card company and say you've got a fraudulent activity notice or something like that, don't reply to that email. Call them up or you go onto their online website and you talk to somebody in their fraud department, you make the call, don't respond to somebody who allegedly represented that company and said you've got a problem. So. Which gets me back to the whole concept of a subject line. And there are ways, there's actually ways to verify the attachments. But if an email has a blank subject line or simply open this, that person didn't follow, didn't follow good email etiquette, left the subject line blank or short and didn't have anything to do with it. And if it doesn't make sense, don't open it. That's why I want your emails to make sense. If the body of the message contains just the link in blue, don't open it. Somebody says, hey, I'm sending you an attachment regarding something, 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 the APCUG conference coming up or whatever. That looks pretty good, especially if they've signed off from somebody within APCUG or your local computer club. But if they didn't even sign off on it, you got to wonder who it really came from. Most of your email systems on your computer, I don't speak on the, on the smartphone, but on your computer will allow you to move your mouse over the hyperlink to show you the website that you may be redirected to or misdirected to. And it's totally possible to code a hyperlink from, to, to say it's from Chase and it's gonna go to who knows where virus.com and get you totally infected. So you wanna hold your mouse out there and look to see where that link is going. And if it doesn't look like a Chase or an Amazon or something that the person allegedly said they were representing those companies, that's how scammers work and spammers work to steal your identity. So be careful 
what you open. There's a lot of garbage going on out there. So don't be so quick to open those links. If it smells, if it looks odd, it probably is. Be suspicious. Send it to somebody else. Forward it to somebody else and say, hey, does this look bad? If you're not sure, but don't open it. Now, I mentioned that there are some websites available that allow you to check the integrity of other websites. If you do hold your mouse over that hyperlink on an email and you can see another website address, you can actually copy it or write it down. And you can go to Norton Safe Web or Trend Micro's uh, website or virustotal.com and actually type it in. And, and those, those agencies, and there are others out there, those are just three that I know of, can actually verify the, the safety of the other website um, and, and see that it's clean or it's not clean. Most of the time, if it looks funny, it's probably going to be funny. So there's a lot more out there. You want to check those, those links to see that you're not going to get infected. So we do have a lot of phishing scams that go on, and you want to avoid them at all costs. Microsoft, Dell, Norton, McAfee, Trend Micro, the IRS, they're not going to call you informing you that you didn't file your taxes, you owe me money, or that your computer is totally infected with hundreds and thousands of viruses. Click here, and we'll just log into your computer remotely, take over your computer, and we'll fix it for you. And kind of while we're at it, we'll steal the information, or maybe we'll install some kind of key logger or something else and further abuse your system. So let us, whoever us is, is not the U.S. It's usually somebody in a foreign country trying to deal with that. Most of the stuff is a problem. So don't let anybody take over your computer remotely. And if they call you or email you and say, hey, we found all these viruses, let us fix it, uh, only charge you. We guarantee we'll fix it for $39.95, the Earl Scheib paint job. It ain't going to happen. I will recommend that you do have, to further protect yourself, a good up-to-date virus protection. Also have up-to-date malware or spyware protection. Virus protection alone will not protect your system from damaging viruses or damaging malware, despite the claims that all of the virus protectors out there claim they protect against everything. So you want to arm yourself with good protection that's the first line of defense against these phishing scams. And don't open those phishing scams if they come in. Apple users, Mac users, and those of you using the Android-based system, you're now subject to serious infections. Mac systems and Androids are no longer exempt from being seriously infected. I've encountered several Macs with 200, 300 infections out there. So it is something that is an issue that needs to be dealt with. But that's all I'm going to say about virus protection right now. So there's more email phishing scams than the other one, the new ones out there. It's been around for a while. Your known friend, me, has sent you files on Dropbox or Google Docs. And that's what the email said. So click here and download the important files that I've sent you. Well, if you click here, you're going to get another screen that shows a legitimate looking logo from Gmail, from Yahoo, uh, from AOL that says, click in here, give us your username and your password, and your password, click OK, and we'll get to the files that your friend sent to you. Well, you're never going to get those files. They're not there. Your friend and me didn't send them. And congratulations, you just gave your email address to a password and your password to a scammer. And believe me, I've seen people fall for that one. Don't do it. Uh, there's scams out there that are, that are getting real tricky. And again, they can all look legitimate. I mentioned earlier about the Can Spam Act. That's not something you buy at the grocery, well, you could buy it at the grocery store. It's a can of spam, but no, it's not. Uh, the FTC instituted the Can Spam Act in 2003 under the Bush administration and it established the first national standard for sending of commercial email, and the FTC is supposed to enforce it. I will say that most of the reliable email marketing uh, companies, such as um, Constant Contact, MailChimp, the Vertical Response, will actively adhere to the canned spam provisions. 
I cannot send you an email unless you say to me, I want to receive your newsletter. And you actually, that's an opt in. Uh, if I do put you on a mailing list, uh, I have a responsibility to put an opt out on the bottom of my email that says I want to opt out of receiving your newsletter or your monthly, quarterly, or whatever. That's how can spam somewhat enforces it the best they can. It is difficult to enforce everywhere, especially with the, a lot of the overseas email senders, but it's an attempt to, to narrow it down, at least for the legitimate ones. Now, the actual title of this is Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act of 2003. You can go out to Google and look up the actual act if you're so inclined. Basically, we use the word canning to put an end to spam. We do the best we can. So speaking of more advanced topics on email etiquette, what people should and shouldn't be doing, uh, I'm not making a lot of today's discussion up. A lot of it is personal experience, but there is an email out there. There is a website out there called netmanners.com, and it's been around probably about uh, 15 years or longer, uh, and that's a good resource for learning more about proper email etiquette. You can follow them on Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, things like that. They actually have 101 email etiquette tips that you can download. And the website for that is on the screen and it will be in the PowerPoint when I post it or have it posted after the presentation later today. So you don't have to write that down. It'll be available, but you can write it down if you like. 101 email etiquette tips.com. That's from netmanners.com. That would be the dear Abby of the email etiquette world. So one thing I emphasize is the understand to reduce your frustration if your email is not working. Understand the email technology and terminology that's out there. There's really two types of email, good ones and bad ones. No, not good ones and bad ones, safe ones and not. There's webmail, which we would get from the Yahoo's, the AOL's, the Gmail's of the world simply by going to yahoo.com, aol.com, uh, gmail.com, things like that. There's webmail for your private domains, which would be mybusiness.com, mynname.com, mypersonalname.com. Most of your web hosting providers and, your, and have an email that you can get via webmail by going to the website. The other type of email is what we'll call local mail, and that uses email client software, such as your Outlook, which seems to be the industry standard for the Windows world, Thunderbird, which comes to us from Mozilla, the makers of Firefox, and something I use. EM Client is a, is a good player out there uh, up in Sunnyvale in Silicon Valley, and they actually have a good product. Eudora Opera, they've been around for years. Uh, Windows Live Mail is a new player out there since uh, a couple of years back, I believe. That's the Windows version of an alternative to Outlook or Microsoft. And Mac Mail, which is a default email product. Uh, on the Mac, uh, the, the, uh, the Mac environment. But the more you understand and know that these things exist, the less frustrated you're gonna be when your email may not be working. And I've got more slides on that. Your web mail, again, just log into the appropriate website, enter your email address and manage your mail. Local mail uses the client software and has certain protocols for both incoming and outgoing email. Pop mail, what we call pop or pop three, stands for plain old post office. IMAP, which is the more preferred environment, internet message access protocol, or MAPI, which is being used for Microsoft Exchange. Uh, not everybody has that, but you need to be aware it's there, be aware of that it's there. Your outgoing mail protocols are always gonna be SMTP, so if somebody asks you what your outgoing mail system is or your, your outgoing mail server, it's going to be an SMTP type of environment. We talk about client software, and again, there's many of them out there when you're not using webmail. Outlook, Thunderbird, Mac, Outlook Express, uh, the old one that was retired with Windows XP. Uh, AOL uses that AOL desktop. Uh, kind of a memory hog, but that's how they get their mail in a local environment. Microsoft Mail was the 
mail system and Windows Vista only, short-lived. And after that, they came out with Windows Live Mail, email client. Uh, EM client is actually for Windows only. They are working on a Mac platform, but haven't done it yet. But it's actually reliable. Opera, Eudora, SeaMonkey. SeaMonkey is also a, a derivative of the Thunder, of the Mozilla family. Uh, and it has more features available. So there are a number of email products out there that are besides Outlook. You don't need to always use Outlook. Some of these are low cost or free. Thunderbird is free. Um, but you do need to know a lot of information, especially when you're using the my company, me at mycompany.com uh, or, or, or things like that. Uh, your, your Gmails are pretty standard, your Yahoo's pretty standard, but you do need to know certain information when using an email client software, uh, such as uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Outlook or Thunderbird. You need to know the POP server name or the incoming server name. It could be a POP or an IMAP. What is the server name? And it may be uh, incoming at verizon.net, happens to be one for Verizon. Uh, outgoing, the SMTP server. What is it? SMTP.gmail.com happens to be the Gmail outgoing uh, web, uh, web server name or, or outgoing server name. You also need to know your username and the password to log into those servers. And again, when you're using an Outlook type of program or a Thunderbird, you'll need to know the port settings, SSL settings, and there's some advanced options. Those settings are difficult to back up, so you might want to do a screenshot, take a picture of it, capture the screen, and copy it to a Word file or notepad. So if you need to remember that information for your particular email, it's a good idea to write that down. It is not something that I can back up using backup software. Um, now, I will say that the, uh, the email server settings on the previous screen do work 90% of the time on your smartphone or your tablet, uh, but sometimes you gotta play around with them. You need to know what those settings are. The server names are usually correct, but they may not work the same way on an iPhone or an iPad. I've seen differences between iPhone and iPad, Android, uh, different versions of my iPhone, iOS 8, iOS 9, Android, things like that. It may work in one way, but not on the other. So kind of know the basic settings and the different options so that you can play around with your particular smartphone or tablet and get your email to work. It is not, uh, it is not difficult, sometimes takes time with the small keyboards we deal with, but basically write the basic information down from the previous screen and start playing around with it. You know, you can always call tech support and do the best you can. Now, if you're tired of the ads that came with Yahoo webmail, or you wanna check your AOL mail without using the AOL desktop or going to AOL.com. Or you want to do the same thing if you're using att.net, spcglobal.net, Earthlink, Verizon, anybody, a Roadrunner from Time Warner. Uh, you can actually organize all your email addresses from your, all your messages from multiple email addresses. Use a combined address book. That's where email client software comes into play, your Outlook, your Thunderbird, your EM client. And you can actually get your Yahoo Mail without ads, your Gmail, your AOL without its news headline and its advertising. You can actually print your messages without some of the embedded advertising uh, that's out there. So the, the look and feel for all of your email addresses will look the same as opposed to when you go to yahoo.com or gmail.com and they look totally different and the screen looks different. So using an email client program makes it a lot cleaner and a lot easier to use. Now, if you do use, do use those uh, pieces of software, you wanna stay as current as possible with the latest versions that you can afford and that are compatible on your computer. Uh, Outlook is a paid product with Microsoft. Mac Mail comes with the, uh, the Mac product. Thunderbird is free, it's cross-platform between Windows, Mac, and I believe Linux. EM client is free or paid depending on how you use it, and AOL only works with AOL. Now, I will say that the reason you wanna stay current is for increased security 
of your email and your email messaging. You want that to stay current as current as possible. That's for your, that's for your benefit. Now, summarizing most of the information on email, short subject lines that relate to the content of the message, your paragraph structure, you should use some line spacing, not one run-on sentence. Use blind carbon copy. Don't forget to use it. Don't, don't be so quick to send stuff using two or carbon copy. Don't forget blind carbon copy is out there and it kind of hides who's sending all those, who's receiving all those messages. Good for advertising and marketing and general announcements. Your paragraph spacing, your signatures, sign off with your name. Uh, replying to email blasts, don't reply and reply all. Be careful how you do that. You can manage your various messages by with personal project folders and empty your trash. Uh, email protection tips, be careful, be suspicious out there. Don't assume that your spouse or significant other uh, is sending you clean mail. You don't know if his or her email system got hacked. It happens. Uh, don't be a spammer. The FTC may come after you. Uh, other people, even your email hosting company may come after you more often than that. Find out more at netmanners.com. Uh, there is email technology, the terminology, SMTP servers, incoming servers, IMAP, POP, things like that. You need to know what they are. All of your email providers can give you that information if you sign into their website and you can search for email settings. Uh, your smartphones and tablets, so use the same settings. I say hesitantly, most of the time it works, but there are issues where it's not. And again, there are alternate clients available to you besides uh, Outlook or Webmail. Uh, you don't have to use that and you can get a cleaner look. So I'm happy to take any questions that are available on email security, email etiquette, uh, the information in the middle screen. Uh, I am holding my baton, as you see on the right-hand side, conducting myself here. That's my contact information uh, that I'm available at. You can email me. And as when mentioned earlier, I am happy to come to your computer club or do it remotely. Uh, and talk about perfecting your backup. Many of you have probably heard me talk about that. Uh, cybersecurity, and of course, today's discussion of email etiquette. So as needed, I can take questions as we have time. Yeah, I've got one for you that somebody want to know, uh, is there any recourse and what you can do if your address has been uh, harvested and being used as spoofing? Oh, well, the, the first thing we do is uh, the recourse, not that I'm aware of, because it does happen regularly, um, is, is to change your password immediately. That's the first line of defense is if, you, if you've been hacked and you have been spoofed, uh, change, your, change your password. Uh, the other thing I will mention is that don't save your passwords for all of your various logins uh, on your on your email or on your web excuse me on your web browser uh, that saves a lot of email login information. I had a client who uh, accidentally saved all that information in in his uh, Firefox and he got spoofed. His email provider cut him off, and it took us a while because we found no viruses, no spyware. And I finally went into his his Firefox and looked at his saved settings. And I said to, to Jim, not Jim, I mean, I'll make up a name. Uh, I said to the client, I said, who's George? And they said, we don't even have, and I know most of this person's password schemes that he uses, uh, one of my regular clients. And I said, who's George? They said, we have no idea who George was. Well, whoever George was put a link in to his browser and put a saved password in there. And that's somehow we believe that that whole thing got compromised. So we tend to save passwords too easily, um, and, and I think we should not. I mean, I, I know we have a lot of passwords for various things we sign into. So answering the question, long story short, uh, there's really no recourse that I know of to go after somebody, but the first line of defense is to change your password. All right, how about if person A doesn't do the blind copy and sends out a whole bunch of emails and everybody sees the emails. And so person C 
copies your email address and then uses it as their return address to send out spam. Same, same issue. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's, well, you, it's your fault for sending it out without using blind carbon copy. Um, that's why we do it that way. I mean, I don't know that there's a legal thing you can do to go after somebody who stole my identity. That becomes, you know, an identity issue. Uh, you'd have to talk to your, to your agency, your, you know, enforcement agency to deal with that. But I don't know of any service that will allow you to do that kind of recourse. Uh, and that's why I mention all these protection schemes, because you want to protect yourself from these things happening. Um, it, it, it's one of the, and that's where the password, you know, I don't like saving my passwords because I get myself exposed in doing that. I hope that answers what you're asking. Yeah. Well, I think sometimes it's a matter of if things get so bad, you're just going to have to get another email address. Right. That's that's. I have not done that. I have not seen that as the worst case. Um, I, I have had people been cut off uh, from their email because they were classified as a spammer, uh, because they got hacked and all that stuff is going out there. Um, so that, that becomes a worst case scenario. And that, again, we ask the questions, what should I be preventative and proactive and don't, you know, don't do the wrong thing. Use your blind carbon copy. You, you might even consider, you know, having multiple email addresses and you use a lot of people use a shopping address that they only use when they shop online and a personal address, uh, for normal correspondence. So they have two identities and that limits the exposure on the email as well as the credit card issues when you do shop online. That's one of the, uh, not tricks, one of, one of the methods people use and we do find a, an anonymous email address that's only used when I go to Amazon or Home Depot or Michael, some of those who have, uh, who have been hacked over the years, you know. So that, that's an alternative. The other thing I'll mention is that when you do go to a webmail interface, a Yahoo, a Gmail, sign out. We tend to sign in. We tend to tell our web browser, remember me. And we tend to X to exit that Windows window, that, that, that browser window. And yet we don't sign off. We allow it to remember me, remember my password. And, you know, there are things out there that can steal that information. If somebody's asking you to sign into something, a username, a password, you've got to assume there's an option to sign out or log out. And that is for your protection. So do it. I know we, we tend to get lazy and not do that. Um, if they've asked you to sign in, try to sign out. So okay. that's, that's the recommendation. Yeah. Uh, a lot of good information that you've shared with us today. Thank you. Uh, and for anybody else, if you have questions, his email is right there. Uh, we will go back through the chat, and if we've missed something, we will make sure that Elliot uh, has that sent to him, and he can answer it, and we can get back to you. Okay. Um,